or for fathers who may pick this book up and read it to say, I need to tell my child my side, whether the, even for the fathers who are in the home with their children, sometimes we are thinking it's okay, I'm here, but you don't use your voice. You don't talk to your children. You don't sit with your children and share your narrative. So that's what hopefully this book will do is encourage, encourage those stories. dive into and so that kind of leads us on to talking about the family patterns and what I like to say the patterns the different patterns that we have in our lives really determine our legacy and it's up to us if we contribute to that legacy to pursue that main purpose of the legacy or we contribute to contribute to that legacy and turn it in a little different direction and so in my studies I feel that we always have to embrace our foundation because you cannot ever get away with it. It makes who you are, but it's up to you to determine how you are going to take the legacy for your generation and set it up for the next generation. And in your book, you talk about a lot of family patterns, but I really want to touch on the family patterns that you saw with your father. And so you talked about distant fathers and workaholic in relationships. So how did that family pattern work its way into becoming who you are today? Very, very uh, important part of my development. Uh, but if you don't mind, I want to go back and clarify something and then pull it forward and make it relatable okay. to this particular question. What I mean in regards to a woman of that particular caliber not resting on her laurels, if you will, or her attributes or assets and think that's just okay. It's not just to simply put the onus or the responsibility on the woman to continue to improve herself or maintain that whatever that attribute is that drew the man to her. It's more so this, to make the person who seeks you, your suitor, feel that they too have to continue to work to earn something from you. We take a lion lioness uh, analogy, as you as you pointed out, one is a hunter and has to provide for their tribe or their group, if you will. But they know the moment they can no longer provide, that tribe or that group is going to find another provider. So it's a matter of putting responsibility up front and on the table of what does it take to continue to feel honored by this privilege of being associated with this person. If you don't put that out front, if you don't make that known as soon as possible that you are valuable, but you require certain things in order to continue to be in that circle, you'll get taken for granted. Uh, but it goes likewise that just because you had what it took to get the man, don't think you're the only one with it. You got to right. continue to do things to prove yourself, surely, to... Uh, continue to draw him in and continue to, uh, to attract him and to continue to catch his eye or his heart, whatever it is that drew him to you, his intellectual, um, the intellectual stimulation. Um, the term that was very popular several years ago was saposexual. And, and I include that to be part of uh, that list of things that I'm attracted to. So if that's part of what drew the two of you together, continue to develop in those areas. So what, how that comes in full forward is this, that I, developed those understandings by having to look at myself because I didn't necessarily have what I would call the, the perfect role models and men in my life that could give me wisdom of this is what you want or what you do not want in a person that you're planning to spend your life with. And so looking at my the women in my life who were critical in my development, as I highlighted earlier, my maternal grandmother, my mother, even my youngest sister, who we, you know, she acts like she's everybody's mama still. Um, looking at the positive, <laughs> looking at the positive attributes of these women and going, well, I certainly know that I want the woman of my dreams, the wife that I was spending the rest of my life with, to have these certain attributes. But even looking at what went wrong in the relationships that, 
that the men in my life participated in to, to self-analyze what do I share in common with them and what things allow them to fail because I put the onus of failure on them for them to fail in the relationships that deteriorated. What caused them to experience divorce? What caused them to experience separation from the children that they were responsible for, for uh, helping to co-create? And said, so if I could pinpoint, uh, identify their failures or their weaknesses or where they lack and begin to work on myself in those areas and identify how the strengths and the women that I, I idolize almost in a sense can help um, assure that I don't step into that same pathway and somehow marriage those two together, then maybe I'll have different success. So that's where that list of attributes sort of uh, begin to grow from. <clears throat> and the more that uh, I looked at those men, they sort of served as the litmus test for me. Yeah. If I was engaged in certain activities or I felt my relationships were headed in a certain direction that reminded me of their failures, then it would be it, it would be the warning bell for me to correct my actions. Not yeah. always, not not always in a not not always in a friendly way either, in a way that I would want them to. It was alarming literally at times to go, whoa, wait, this is this is not what I want. But this after I reached a certain level of maturity. I didn't have that early on. It was it took a lot of failing to get to to get to that point. And then ultimately I began to think beyond myself that it has to end somewhere. Right. And it has to end with someone. So why not why not me? Why not take the responsibility for however hard this process may be to figure it out in my generation? So that the next generation, even if I fail, will have a leg up and that they'll have someone who's more willing to be more transparent or expressive about the process so that they can have a better chance of succeeding. I hope Absolutely. I got back to the question. Yeah, yes, you did. You did. And you really, you talked about really standards. And I want to just make sure that people understand that standards, everybody should have standards. And, and I know just from, you know, having a lot of different friends and, and a lot of them being women and them saying like, how dare people tell me my standards are too high, right? And yeah. so, and then I also, from some of my male friends who will say to me, to me, and then also to some of my other um, uh, friends who are women and they'll say, no, keep your standards high, keep those standards high. And don't listen to what people say and your standards are too high. As long as those standards have substance and meaning to your life and what you want, keep those standards. And so I'm glad you, you touched on that and you even brought that to the forefront in the book of men having standards and, and having an idea and a vision of who they want in the mate. Because I think that mate part is what a lot of people, Mm, I want to say sometimes get and sometimes don't get. And I say that because people get married for different reasons. It's not always about love. Sometimes it's about security, uh, business, you know, whatever it is. But I think just remaining true to who you are. And like you said, showing to be transparent so that that person knows who they're getting into in that mate part. How are y'all working together? You right? What are you bringing what are they bringing to get to the ultimate goal that you have together, your partner, your mate in that in that particular situation? So, and you hit definitely on legacy. And I saw that throughout the book, different patterns. So we talked about the circles uh, earlier and it's like these circles keep coming, circles on different topics. And even when you talk about changing the trajectory for the next generation, you guys don't have to worry about this next generation because all these other circles, y'all have to accomplish that because no one person can accomplish all the different circles that we have to tackle in life. It's just not going to work. But if what you can do in your lifetime to end one particular cycle and set it off to a good point so that the next generation doesn't have to reinvent the wheel, right? They can start and tackle those other ones to make it better for the next generation. I think that's so important. And what you also said that was I want to make sure that people pick up on is that everything we do affects the next thing that we do. And so the life you live today is affecting your decisions 
in your experience, experiences that's going to help someone um, in the future. And so we talked about the women who influenced your life. So talk about the male influences. Um, in the book, you referenced how they spoke to you, uh, like someone referred to you as, hey, reverend, which ended up being true, right? right? Mm -hmm. They did. And also, um, someone addressed you with their expectations. And um, and you had some uh, admiration for some folks, and you uh, stated that their respect made you have better choices. So talk about the male influences uh, in your life and reverence to the book and how that uh, the role that that played. Yeah. So what I never really got was direct guidance or mentorship from an adult male. So a lot of it came from just analyzing, again, uh, different interaction I had with certain people or encounters I had with certain people and took the best of those encounters, um, whether they were negative encounters and, and used that to balance out for, okay, well, I know I don't want to go down that road because I know how it made me feel in those moments of lack from them. Um, I talk about my fathers and I call them both fathers because they were the father who's responsible for me biologically, who I love tremendously and respect greatly. And because of the distance that uh, in terms of the cities where we grew up, he was not there physically in the way that I imagine he wanted to be. Uh, at least that's the way we're going to see that. And so he couldn't have the, the impact that he may have wanted or I wanted for him to have all of my life. So I knew distance was a it was an issue that would need to be addressed in my relationships. And then the father who I grew and grew up with in the home, um, we could talk about what that looks like in terms of when saying growing up in the home is maybe a loose description because even though he was the head of our household and we grew up in the same home, he was never in the home. He worked as many as two or three jobs, his my entire uh, rearing experience. So he was seldom home. He was seldom a physical force in the house or a physical presence in the house. And when he was there, obviously because he worked so much, it was spent eating, sleeping, and, and other things that he needed to take care of. So um, didn't have that for them. But And then looking at their lives from an external point of other things they were involved in and saying, no, that's not a part of who I am. Parallel that gets you know, other folks that I run into growing up folks who were like adopted uncles or, or uh, teachers or coaches or more the most important influence was when I got to college and my department chair uh, for the for the discipline that I majored in and the interest that he took in my life again no formal relationships just providing great examples for me and providing uh, a model of manhood if you will for me to 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 strive towards but I want to pull out this point that you, you mentioned when you said we set standards. We have to understand where our standard comes from because we could set a standard and attain it and then realize it really wasn't all of that. It's like uh, having a dream destination or uh, a desired um, acquisition, something that we really want to buy. And then we get it and go, it really didn't give me the feeling that I thought it would, or it didn't have as much meaning for me that I thought it would once I got it. And then at that point, after you've gone through all of the paces to attain that goal or to acquire that thing, and you go, now, why did I hold it in such high regard? It's mm -hmm. because you allowed something else to set that standard for you and you didn't understand your motivation behind it. That's a part of maturing to, to really realize where is that coming from? Uh, and I found that out sometimes a little too late and that that caused a little too much hurt and harm. Yeah, definitely. And um, one thing, when I was reading the book and I, and I, you end up hitting on the end because I said, oh, I'm going to ask him this question. I said, oh, he already answered it. And that was, is that you had a moment with your father, uh, your yeah. biological father. And I think that moment as an adult, as um, a father yourself at that particular time, um, yeah. having that moment with your father as a father, 
that I think you realized, wow, my dad has a story too. And maybe I didn't realize his perspective. And so talk to us about that perspective of why you felt it necessary to bring the perspective of the men's side. And folks, I want you to really read the book to get the full explanation of when he talks about the men's side as far as their side in relationships and in and, and parenting and, and just really in business too, because you, you kind of hinted on that too, in business, a different perspective that males may have, but sometimes that gets ignored and always the female side is kind of elevated. Uh, just talk about why you wanted to bring that perspective to the world, really. Well, what, you know, it's a, it's societal in terms of a norm that we're, we gravitate towards the maternal concerns, uh, the mother's issues or the mother's struggle uh, or the mother's presence in a child or children's lives. We, we just expect that from a woman. And the societal norm is to give the male a scapegoat if the male is not present physically. Uh, as long as the male provides financial support, then he's doing his part. He's showing up. But we know, we ought to know by now that that's not enough. That even if the male, if that particular biological male is not present in a child's life, some man needs to step up and be a physical representation of manhood in that child's life, whether a, a, a young boy or a young lady, a teenagers, whatever the case may be. Some of us, even as adults, need some male guidance, uh, mm -hmm. male reinforcement in terms of what that should look like. And so it, it, it sort of clarified for me a couple of things. One, not that my father had a story to tell, I always knew that, but what it clarified for me is just how synonymous our past were. Mm -hmm. I, I knew that, I knew some, there were some big moments in each of our lives that we both had come across in terms of, if we, if we looked at crossroads, if you will, in terms of a map, that we had both met similar crossroads and had to face similar decisions in regards to parenting and marriage and relationships, um, sacrifices that we may have made for uh, those who were in our lives versus uh, where we would have wanted to take our lives ourselves, uh, experiences that we had with our parents. Uh, I knew there were certain big moments when my father began to sit down with me and share with me just what he considered minor stories about his path his relationship with my mother, uh, his relationship with other people that we both admire in, in our lives, it all crystallized for me that we really not only met certain crossroads, we literally walked on some of the same roads yeah. that my feet had stepped in my father's footprints unknowingly and how much valuable would have been if, if I'd had his role map, which is what heartbreak is for my sons, if I'd had his role map, to at least take into consideration, even if I was going to take those same path, I would have an idea of what I was going to face and how to prepare for it. Um, and that's why it held, held such great value for me. And it still does, because I don't think it's ever too late. Uh, it no. may have come earlier in my lifetime with my father, but the fact that we have this relationship and this open channel of communication now and great a great amount of love and admiration and respect for each other. Now, I value that. Could it have been more beneficial for me early on? I believe so, and I can't, I can't deny that. That's the part of me, reason why I'm pouring out now for my sons and for other folks' relationships with their children. It is important for men to tell their side of the story because we glean to the woman's cries or... Um, pouring out experiences, if you will. And not often enough do we hear about the impact of either having or not having our father's present plays in our lives. And so I'm glad a story like this exists out there to, to encourage people to ask for their father's side of the story or for fathers who may pick this book up and read it to say, I need to tell my child my side. 
whether the, even for the fathers who are in the home with their children, sometimes we are thinking, it's okay, I'm here. But you don't use your voice. You don't talk to your children. You don't sit with your children and share your narrative. So that's what hopefully this book will do is encourage, encourage those stories. With, so whether it's a child that's desiring to know their father's story or a father that is really being encouraged to open up and share theirs, their journey, that's what this book is about. We finish up this conversation in part three, the finale of this series. In the meantime, grab his book at Amazon or Barnes & Noble.